Griffiths was born on Christmas Eve 1969 in the town of Dewsbury in West Yorkshire. There doesn't appear to be anything really out of the ordinary in terms of the, the family that Stephen Griffiths comes from. He had two very sort of caring, loving parents, a stable marriage. Um, they were moving up in the world, you know, good, solid Yorkshire folk. But then it all went pear-shaped. Now, I think that happened when Stephen's parents, Moira and Stephen Sr, split up. Griffiths had always been close to his father and he didn't react well to the breakup. We know from listening to some of the reports of people he went to school with, his peers, they've reported that he was a bit of an oddball. He was slightly strange. He would collect hunting knives and he would talk about violence in a way that other children wouldn't. He became very, very withdrawn, very, very difficult to get on with, very disengaged. But also, he was observed being sadistic towards animals. Um, in the back garden of the house they lived in in Wakefield, neighbours saw him. Um, shooting birds and dismembering them. When we look at uh, serial killers who have been abusive towards animals when they were children, that is indicative to me of somebody who is trying to, to gain control. So they turn their attentions to creatures that they can wield power over, and often that's small animals. I think those early indicators were, were there, but he certainly didn't come from the, the hugely dysfunctional background that we see other serial killers come from. Despite his unruly behaviour, Griffiths had a high IQ and his dad worked hard to send him to a £9,000 a year grammar school in Wakefield. He went to private school um, and I think that gave him a kind of veneer of respectability. Had he been a young lad at a badly performing school, you know, in a, in a deprived area, I think perhaps his behaviour would have been problematised much earlier. He would have been on the radar of, of police and social services and agencies like that much earlier. But I think social class and middle classness provides a bit of a protective layer for, for some people who go on to commit murder and serial murder, because we, we don't want to think of middle-class kids as to go on and do things like that. In 1986, at the age of 16, Griffiths dropped out of school, and it wasn't long before the troubled teenager had his first brush with the law. Stephen Griffiths started getting into trouble with the police at the age of 17. He was trying to um, steal some goods from a supermarket in Leeds. When the supermarket manager tried to stop him, he produced a knife and slashed him across the face. The wounds were so severe that the victim needed 19 stitches. Griffiths was arrested and spent a year in a juvenile custodial unit. When he was released, aged 19, he wanted to make a fresh start and enrolled in a psychology course at the University of Bradford. But he was soon in trouble again. In 1989, Griffiths was arrested for possessing an offensive weapon, an air pistol, and sentenced to 100 hours of community service. He got into further trouble when he felt he'd been slighted by some fellow students, female students at the uh, college he studied at. Um, he went up to them, four girls, produced a knife, held the knife to the throat of one of the young girls, and asked her very menacingly what she thought she was laughing at. Understandably, the girl was terrified. He didn't actually attack her, but it was clearly a serious offence. This time, the authorities had had enough. Griffiths was sentenced to two years in prison. During this time, he spent eight weeks at Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire, where the psychology student's behaviour was assessed by a professional. The psychiatrist described him as a sadistic schizoid psychopath. He said he seemed to um, relish the very idea of killing and maiming people um, and really made it absolutely clear that he had a personality disorder which would be, make him a very, very dangerous man indeed. Psychopaths are people who are essentially emotionally empty. They don't have the same range of complex feelings that the rest of us do. They tend to lack remorse. They, they have a, a shallow affect, a kind of a shallowness of feeling. They are prone to boredom. There's a need for kind of stimulation all the time. Um, they can't feel real empathy for other people, so there's an inability to put themselves in someone else's shoes. So it's that kind of coldness, um, that kind of detachment from feelings and from empathy. 
Cathy, really. After his short time at Rampton, Griffiths was moved to Leeds Prison, where reportedly he openly talked to his fellow inmates about murder. Just two days after Suzanne's disappearance, they received news of some horrific footage captured on a CCTV camera in a nearby block of flats, the home of Stephen Griffiths. So everything becomes clear less than 48 hours after Suzanne's disappearance when the caretaker at Homefield Court, the block of flats where Griffiths lives, is reviewing the uh, CCTV footage uh, for the weekend. He's looking at the footage taken from the, the camera outside Griffiths' um, flat. It's a Monday morning. Like any other Monday morning, he's just sort of sleepily winding his way through this, uh, this film. And then all of a sudden, he sees this figure emerging from Griffiths' flat, running, pursued by this figure, which he immediately recognises as Griffiths, carrying what looks like a crossbow. The girl captured running for her life was missing woman, Suzanne Blamires. He took her to his flat. She quite quickly, I think, realised that she was in grave danger and ran out. You see Griffiths chasing after her. You see him shooting at her with a crossbow. You then see him dragging her back into his apartment by her legs. And that wasn't where it ended, because afterwards, he comes up to the camera, he sticks his middle finger up to the camera, and he brandishes the crossbow. In a kind of defiant, angry gesture towards the camera and anybody else who might be looking at him. On May the 24th, 2010, after viewing the footage, police immediately raced to the scene of the attack hoping that Suzanne Blamires may still be alive. Armed police officers turn up at Homefield Court. They storm up the stairs, storm into um, Stephen Griffiths' flat, expecting, really, some resistance. Stephen Griffiths just gives himself up meekly um, and tells police, somewhat inexplicably, that he's Osama bin Laden. Griffiths was immediately arrested and taken to Halifax Police Station. Suzanne Blamires was nowhere to be seen. Griffiths had achieved exactly what he'd set out to do. With his self-proclamation, the case had now picked up immense media attention and the nation was in shock. Can you confirm your name to the court, he was asked. Barely audible, the psychology graduate believed to have been studying criminology replied, the crossbow cannibal. After he announced himself as the, the crossbow cannibal, of course, there was only one story that the whole media were talking about, and that was it. It just took over. I was just sitting there st speaking to a colleague. We said, have you seen this? Can you believe that? At that time, we'd never seen anything like it before. Most of the time, th these courtings are, are, are kind of anodyne, sterile affairs. But there, this guy had, um, you know, stood up and announced himself as this, this you know, self-confessed serial killer. And really, we were just flabbergasted. But could Griffiths really have eaten his victims? Or was this just more bravado from the macabre showman? I think looking at, did Stephen Griffiths cannibalise his victims? I think it's a possibility, because this is a guy who really didn't appear to have any boundaries around his, his killing behaviour. But at the same time, he's aware of the, the power of that statement, the impact that saying he's done that will have on his reputation. And he'd come up with that, that moniker, the crossbow cannibal. So he had to claim that he'd done that, even if he had Evidence found in Griffith's flat suggested he may actually be telling the truth. There was um, a certain amount of DNA evidence on Griffith's cooker, which, of course, you know, sort of tends to back it up. But also, I think, um, it's a case of there being no real reason to disbelieve him. And Griffith's, in his um, interviews with the police, was more or less um, truthful. He was incomplete, but he was truthful. And I think as far as they knew, he didn't make up any outright, outright lies. And if you think about Stephen Griffiths and what he tried to do, achieve notoriety by somehow concocting, contriving this series of very unpleasant, very gruesome, very shocking murders, um, 
then the idea of um, cannibalism would fit into that kind of jigsaw. I think when we look at the amount of time that Stephen Griffiths has spent with the, the bodies of his victims and what he's done with those bodies, he allegedly cannibalised uh, some of the victims, he's, he's dismembered the bodies, he's taken pictures of them. This is somebody who's quite comfortable around death, around dead bodies and, and the, the various things that come along with that. Other serial killers are, are more repulsed you know, by dead bodies, so it's, it's the crime itself it's it's the, the the act that's important for some, whereas I think it's the process that was important for Stephen Griffiths.